Welcome to CEOs You Should Know. I'm Christina Mendonca, and today we're talking with CEO Matt Levitt from Tahoe Blue. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much for having me, Christina. Tahoe Blue is on a juggernaut now, but I know it had some humble beginnings. Talk to me about how you kept the faith in your vision for Tahoe Blue as you were building the company. Well, the vision was, the idea was to create a vodka that captures the essence of Lake Tahoe both from the aspect of clear, pure, smooth waters, but also the lifestyle, right? Because when I say Tahoe, we all picture sunsets and sailboats and powder skiing. And and the thought was, if I could create this vodka that wraps all of that up into a feeling, Tahoe's really a feeling, right? Uh, That the product should be an easy choice for California and Nevada consumers, West Coast consumers, ultimately, Tahoe, I believe, and the idea of relax, escape, and recharge resonates everywhere. But uh, when I was determined to bring the product to market and got the first batch made, I couldn't get any of the distributors in the area to pick the brand up because they typically, big distributors don't do business with little like mom and pop size companies with no brand awareness and no volume and no advertising budget. And so I got my own distributor's license. I made some very low tech sell sheets by taking pictures of the bottles from the first batch in my yard in the snow. And I went to work selling it out of the trunk of my car. I put a put a, a laptop and a printer on the passenger seat and hooked them to a power converter and then loaded the trunk up so I could go make a sales call, go back out to the car, run the invoice, make the delivery, and kind of build out the display all in one stop. And it was um, very uh, modest, kind of rinky-dink operation for the first year or so, but it also it had to happen in hindsight. I had to know... Yeah, it's like if you want to own a restaurant, the best place to start is probably in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Uh, y- you need to know what all the pieces are that make it go. And so uh, it's it's really amazing. Uh, I'm still amazed on a daily basis at how far the brand has come. What did you do before you made vodka? Serial entrepreneur, previous small business owner. Uh, the, the business actually right before this, I owned uh, some paint stores, Benjamin Moore house paint stores. Okay. In Tahoe and Carson Valley, uh, went to school for business management and marketing, both undergrad and grad degree, undergrad degree in Maryland, and then went back to school for my MBA in, at uh, UNR. Let's talk about the vodka. What is the most important ingredient that goes into great vodka? 80 proof vodka is 40% alcohol, which means it's 60% water. So one could argue the most important ingredient is the water and the quality of the water. But most vodkas, particularly American vodkas, are made from grain. Uh, Wheat, corn, rye are all common grains. But Tahoe Blue is a blend. And the reason we did that is because grain vodka has this inherent bite that tastes vaguely of rubbing alcohol. A lot of people don't like vodka because they say it reminds them of the way rubbing alcohol smells. And that's because, molecularly speaking, it's not terribly dissimilar from industrial-grade alcohol. Uh, So... We took a different approach. Instead of starting with the cheapest crop available and distilling it over and over again, like most of the other guys do, we started with better ingredients, grapes, corn, and sugarcane, distilled them separately, blended together, and then distilled again in a copper pot still by hand. And that is uh, a totally different approach. It's I haven't seen it anywhere else in vodka. I don't know that. I can't say for certain that we're the only blended vodka on the market, but we're the only one that I'm aware of. It's very unusual. Um, and I think the quality of the ingredients and the quality of the water using Tahoe water uh, makes it all the difference. And because of that, the brand's been nationally recognized as being you know one of the best tasting vodkas on the market. You have a brand new distribution deal, I know. So... Does that mean you're taking Tahoe Blue to the world? No, we are. Uh, so we did. We just signed a regional West Coast regional distribution agreement with a company called RNDC that is, in effect, like the second biggest liquor distributor. Most of the alcohol sales in the U.S. are controlled by two main distributors, and uh, this is one of those. And it so up until now, Tahoe Blue has only been available in northern california and northern nevada and this will immediately add in fact we're, st- we're starting now this week southern california with plans to move to adjacent states some some combination of arizona washington hawaii something like that over the next year or two mm-hmm. and then from there the the 
distributor operates in 40 states. And so we'll look at expanding out from there. I'm curious, are you getting more looks now because of the war in Ukraine? I mean, not all vodka is made in Russia, obviously, but it is aligned with that country. So how has that impacted your business? It's an interesting way of phrasing that yeah. question because a lot of the vodkas that we perceive to be Russian vodkas actually can be made in effect anywhere. Um, it, it definitely has affected our business uh, for the better. Proceed delicately here because it's not lost on me that, you know, they're at war over there. And we certainly don't want any business th that way. And you Absolutely. know, our, our hearts go out to all the people that are displaced. Uh, that said, a lot of retailers are deleting all of the Russian branded vodkas from their sets, which creates holes in the mm -hmm. set on the shelf. And then right. they look for domestic vodkas. And so it's certainly creating some lift. Can you top line for us? What is the growth philosophy and what is your marketing plan moving forward? And the reason that we're still here when 98% of craft spirits companies don't make it to, let's say, 10,000 cases in annual volume is that our growth philosophy has actually been, for lack of a better description, small bites. When I started the company, it was just South Lake Tahoe and then Tahoe. And what I learned, as excited as I was to get the product to market, you know, full of ignorant enthusiasm mm -hmm. and, and uh, taking the product to market and going, you know, convinced this is going to be the next big deal in vodka tahoe blue it's going to explode it's a great idea the liquid is fantastic and the branding is catchy and and you know we're philanthropic and there's all these reasons why people are going to love it it, it didn't sell to my dismay not right away and it took me until i got my first chain account uh chain grocer and that was safeway to pick it up and then when i went in to check on the product at some of the Safeway stores, I couldn't find it because there's 200 vodka products on the aisle. And then I realized it could be the best vodka in the world, and the best fit for the market, but you have to advertise to create some sort of awareness of the brand and also to differentiate yourself with the consumer as to why, why Tahoe Blue versus. So I started with a very small advertising campaign in Tahoe local newspaper, TV, radio, I think the budget was you know, $5,000 a year. The product started to move, started to take off, and it took me about a year to get it to the point where I was getting regular reorders without having to kind of force it out off store shelves. So I took what I learned there, developed a strategy, raised some capital, and then rolled the brand out in Reno in Northern Nevada. Bigger market, still not a big market, you know, half a million people or so, but uh, a lot bigger than Tahoe, obviously. And so then the same thing, rollout campaign, TV, radio, print, a lot of sampling, a lot of liquid to lips. It's always really important as part of our strategy to grow the brand that people taste it because it does taste better. And we have a high conquest rate and a high adoption rate from other brands. And so we really want people to taste it. So Spent a year or two just on northern Nevada before we turned to Sacramento and Central Valley, which was 2016, and then did the same thing there. Added the Bay Area about two and a half years ago. And so the idea is at one step at a time, owning a market and then, and then expanding from there because we want to be sure that the product is, is rooted before you can really kind of t turn your back for a little bit and go focus on somewhere else. I want to talk to you about your philanthropy, but first, can you give some advice to other entrepreneurs? What were some of the things that helped you? I would say that, uh, first of all, don't assume it's not a good idea just because it's not been done yet because that's one of the things I think that stops us all from chasing those product ideas and dreams that we have is we think, well, it doesn't exist. There must be a reason and not even go into it. Um, expect it to take, you know, three times longer and cost three times more than your initial estimates to get the product launched. And most of the people around you will tell you it's not going to work along the way. And so you have to have that uh, that attitude of n knowing, of believing, and this deep well of optimism and enthusiasm for the project and the ability to, even when you're getting beat up day after day, wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and tell yourself, 
it's going to work. Even when you were selling out of your car with a printer sitting on the passenger seat? And you can't possibly see how that could ever grow into a business from there, right? Let's talk about clean up the lake. I know this is a scuba diving effort to pull garbage off the bottom of the lake, keep it clean. I mean, this is your product. You get the water for your vodka from Lake Tom, so I know this has to be close to you. Talk to me about how you got involved in the effort. Born and raised in Maryland, I go on this road trip after I graduate from business school out to see the the West, and I stumble into Tahoe. I'd heard of it, uh, seen pictures of it, but you really have to stand on the shores of the lake to fully grasp the wowness, clarity of the water, and and just the way it smells, you know, clean air. And because that view and that feeling in the lake changed my life. You know, this trip from Maryland was supposed to be round trip, and it, that was 22 years ago. So I decided to stay in Tahoe for a weekend, and then that became a few weeks, that became a few months, and then signed a lease, and then I started business, and the years have passed. So it was important to me right away that Tahoe Blue not only embody all things Tahoe, but make a difference. That early in the company's history that we're donating even if our resources were, were, were relatively modest at the time, the donations, they weren't going to be very big when I you know, only sold 400 cases that first year. But I started donating right away because I wanted the brand to be synonymous with preserving the lake instead of being a vodka company that donates sometimes. I wanted to be you know, a philanthropic company that also makes vodka that, that, you know, a preservation company that also makes vodka. That was the idea is kind of spinning it around a little bit. Unlike a lot of big business, which waits till they're at a billion dollars in revenue and then spins off some nonprofit arm because I can't possibly figure out how to spend it all. It was like, no, this is, you know, I wasn't even paying myself, but we were making donations. What was your first donation? Like how much for your very first donation? $500 or something to help pay for a beach cleanup after one of the big holidays. I mean, they, they, were, they were really small donations. But fast forward now, we're 10 years since I sold the first bottle, eight years since it really became a functioning business. And Tahoe Blue had its first full-time employee, which was me. Um, we've donated over $200,000 to a variety of projects and a variety of nonprofits. And uh, this most recent one, the scuba trash removal project, Clean Up the Lake, has been enormously successful. We've pulled more than 22,000 pounds of trash out of the lake, uh, 20,000 some odd separate items. And so we've got a team of divers that's been diving every day for almost a year. And, uh, well, everyday weather permits and mm -hmm. we weren't smoked out and yeah. there, there, there are a couple of delays along the way, but, uh, so we have a, a team, there's six or eight of us that go into the water. I've, I've participated in some of those dives. It's underwater trash pickup. You know, you go down there with a mesh bag and you're picking up beer cans and bottles and sunglasses and all kinds of stuff. So some of which has fallen off boats and some of which has been deliberately, discarded into the lake by people partying along the beaches and uh, bonsai rock and which is a little disheartening but it m does make you feel a little better most of the trash is older mm -hmm. than newer so i think we've all become more aware about packing out what we brought in I, I think there's less new pollution going into the lake now than there was say in the you know 1970s and 80s because there's a lot of old beer cans like peel peel top <laughs> beer cans and pepsi cans and um, that's probably like beverage containers are probably the number one thing item that we're removing. Well, your love for the lake is apparent. Your love for making great vodka is evident as well. So we want to thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge with us. Thank you so much for having me. Matt Levitt of Tahoe Blue right here on CEOs You Should Know. I'm Christina Mendonca.